So good afternoon, guys. Uh, it's interesting, you have now back-to-back -back Indian speakers, and it's that time of the afternoon where you start dozing off a little bit if the coffee hasn't kicked in yet. Trust me, you don't want to be dreaming with an Indian, Indian accent, right? So get, get your coffee, make sure you wake up. Networking is exciting, yeah? I see a few smiles, that's good. good. So my name is uh, Karthik Prabhakar. I work for a company called Tegera. Um, Tigera is, is fairly active in the networking community within Kubernetes networking, but, uh, and, and specifically we work on plugins like Calico. We also are the co-maintainers of Flannel. Uh, we are also one of the co-maintainers of CNI, which is the networking abstraction in Kubernetes. <coughs> so today, uh, what I wanted to kind of walk through with you is a little bit of Kubernetes networking and give you some of the concepts in Kubernetes networking. But before I do that, I want to give you some of the fundamental design thinking that went into building the foundations of Kubernetes networking. And I want to contrast that a little bit with some of the design thinking that went into uh, Neutron back in the early days. Obviously, Neutron has obviously evolved over the last uh, three, four years, but I want to give you some of that uh, contrast between Kubernetes and Neutron because there are some fundamental differences. And that'll put into context for you why Kubernetes networking is the way that it is, okay? And like every Kubernetes presentation, if you don't do a live demo, you're not worth your salt, right? So you gotta do a live demo. What I'm gonna, I'm assuming I can get onto the network, I'd like to deploy a Kubernetes cluster, multiple nodes with networking, launching applications. I've set myself a target of five minutes to do that. I'm hoping I can do it in two, right? And what that means is I want, for those of you who haven't deployed Kubernetes before, I want you to walk out of the room, or maybe you can even do it with me. I want you to walk out of this room and try deploying Kubernetes. Super easy, lots of deployment tool options. Many of them are extremely easy to use. And this is something that everyone can do. Literally everyone in this room should be able to do it. Oh, and a little bit of a plug for tomorrow. So today we're just talking about concepts of Kubernetes networking. Tomorrow we'll actually have a little bit more of an advanced talk talking about how you connect Kubernetes and OpenStack together, whether it's Kubernetes side by side with OpenStack or one in the other. And in fact, I'm joined in that presentation by Canonical and AT&T, and AT&T is gonna be doing a live demo of how they deploy OpenStack as a containerized application on top of Kubernetes. They actually use Calico for the networking fabric there. So a little bit of how we got here, right? So going back to the early days of VM networking, when people started thinking about how they connect different virtual machines to each other, especially in multi-tenant sort of deployment scenarios, the easy way to do that back in the day was, hey, if A needs to talk to B, let's just connect A and B into an overlay network, right? And with, in the early days of OpenStack with things like Neutron, you try and provide this virtual networking concepts to users and allow users to create their own overlay networks. And then if now B needs to talk to C, guess what, you put it in a different overlay network. And very soon you have to worry about what happens if these A needs to talk to C, you actually backhaul it through a virtual router, and then pretty soon the users have to deal with some of the more advanced networking concepts, which very often they don't really care. They just want applications to talk to each other. Right, so eventually it got to a point where you get this complex mess of overlays and then you have to deal with SDN controllers to kind of force overlays into physical network infrastructure. You have, very often with, with Neutron, the way many people have implemented it today, a mess of bridges, reswitches, policy enforcement points, security enforcement points, virtual routers, backhauls. And the case in point, this is a picture from OpenStack documentation of what Neutron with OpenB switch looks like. Standard OpenB switch. For those of you who have this in production, my heart goes out to you. I've, had, I've spent numerous nights and weekends the last three years, and I think a number of my former colleagues can attest to this here in the audience. It, when things break, and the things that break could be in servers right next to each other, troubleshooting this complex mess of overlays can be a real pain. And this gets even worse when you add, add on things like layer three, DVR, VRRP, the complexity just goes on. And that said, you don't need to like Calico and other approaches where you can actually simplify the network 
but let, this is not really a product pitch, this is going to be a technology pitch, and I want to get to the Kubernetes side of things. So here we are, we're here to talk about microservices. Microservices in a cloud native world, right? Here's a picture of what Netflix's application flows look, used to look like going back a few years. It's obviously gotten more complex than this. And when you have these, this large number of micro instances, microservices collaborating with each other, this traditional model of creating overlays between pairs of instances or groups of instances that need to collaborate with each other does not scale. And increasingly, because microservices are very dynamic, the flows tend to vary, things tend, tend to come up and down fairly dynamically. We really have to look at a new approach because increasingly where the world we're moving to is sort of a serverless function as a service world with things, uh, running functions individually in different parts of the infrastructure. And this concept of building overlays for everything is fundamentally a approach that has its roots in the early days of VM networking and we have to move past that, right? So that said, Kubernetes, which is focused on how do you run containers at scale, how do you provide an infrastructure for running microservices at scale, took a different set of assumptions. First of all, the world is IP, right? How many of you have an application that does not use IP? So Kubernetes started with the assumption that it's gonna assume that every node in the cluster has an IP address. It also made the assumption that every pod has an IP address that's unique within the cluster, right? And so when pods communicate over IP addresses, other pods that they communicate with know that IP address and it's the fact that it's unique. So that's a fundamental assumption. And by the way, that is a little bit more evolved from sort of some of the early design thinking that went into the Neutron. Kubernetes then adopted CNI, the Container Network Interface as a networking abstraction to allow different vendors to plug their different networking plugins to provide that connectivity between pods, okay? And today there's numerous plugins, each with their own characteristics and, and different market segments that they go after. So we, we work with, my, my company works with Calico and Flannel, which are fairly popular plugins, but there's plenty of other plugins. The big difference that Kubernetes introduces and in fact, other container orchestrators have also adopted this abstraction, is that it now decouples this concept of using network topology for isolation. What Kubernetes says is, I'm using an IP address, it's up to the network plugin to decide how to connect the instances to each other, but I'm now gonna give users a new abstraction, a declarative model by which they can declare what pods need to talk to what other pods. So users can declare in a YAML syntax using uh, advanced concepts like labels and selectors how they want pods to communicate with each other, which pods they want isolated from each other. So that's declared as opposed to enforced in the network using network topology. And what that allows you to do is you can now build networking plugins that keep the network simple. Uh, absolutely, you can build networking plugins that keep the network complex. You can do it, but you don't have to, right? And this is a fundamental design choice that Kubernetes made. In a Kubernetes environment, because an application or microservice is served by dozens of pods or hundreds of pods, if you have a web server, it could be running as tens of web server instances, you need a concept to abstract away this fleeting, dynamic environment, and that concept is services. So Kubernetes has the concept of services, and we'll talk about how that's implemented in the network. And a service refers to a collection of pods at the back end. We also uh, have sort of a way of uh, discovering services using a variety of options. You can use DNS, but there's other options you can use, and Kubernetes basically presents all of these to you. And in addition to doing services, very often, users and microservices want to do higher level sorts of uh, traffic redirection based on layer five to seven decisions, like HTTP headers, like um, application specific headers, and for that purpose, Kubernetes introduces the concept of ingress, which is something that confuses it. So let's start with a little bit of a dive into what the networking landscape looks like. We'll start with first, simple east-west traffic, pod-to-pod -pod traffic between pods and Kubernetes. 
and then we'll go on to the more abstract concepts like services, ingress, and so on, right? So to begin with, in Kubernetes, a Kubernetes cluster is a collection of nodes. Nodes could be bare metal nodes, it could be virtual machines running on OpenStack, it could be instances running on your favorite public cloud, doesn't matter, it's, it's a bunch of nodes. Some nodes are designated as master nodes, where you're running the Kubernetes control services, and some nodes are designated worker nodes, where you're actually running the pods or the applications. The main services running on the, on the master nodes are things like the API server, which is how you inter interact, how users interact with Kubernetes. You have a scheduler, which helps schedule pods. You have things like the controller manager, which runs a number of controllers, things like add-on managers and other controllers that are part of Kubernetes. But when the master needs to actually schedule nodes to, or schedule pods to run on nodes, it talks to an agent called Kubelet, which is running on the individual nodes, and the Kubelet is responsible for launching those pods and running them. Okay, and so you have this Kubelet agent that's running on every node, uh, every worker node. Within that worker node, I've just called out this concept of the host network namespace. That's typically the Linux networking stack as you and I know it. As you all know, it's possible to create multiple namespaces in Linux, and so we'll get to that concept next. So when Kubernetes launches a pod, a pod in Kubernetes is essentially a collection of containers with a shared network namespace. So typically, that, what that means is that collection of containers shares an IP address, it shares a routing table, it shares some basic network concepts. So it has a separate namespace. And when a kubelet launches a pod, which is a collection of containers, what it does is it now says I need to network this pod and get it connected to the network so it can talk to other pods and talk to the rest of the world. The way it does that in Kubernetes is using CNI. And it's a, CNI is really simple. What, it, what happens is the kubelet calls out to a CNI configuration file at in a, in a high, very high level. It calls out to a CNI configuration file which is stored under slash etsy. And in this case, I've used a Calico example, there's a similar example of Flannel, which I'll talk to, there's other plugins. Each plugin has its own config file in, in, for CNI. And the kubelet basically says, hey, I'm calling you and I have this pod, I want you to connect this pod to the network. And in effect, what happens, and I'm using the Calico example here, uh, Calico, in this case, the Calico CNI plugin says, okay, I need to give this pod an IP address, and I'm creating a virtual ethernet that connects the pod namespace to the host namespace, okay? And so that's sort of the first step, and then it's up to the, it's really up to the plugin as to how it connects that virtual ethernet to the rest of the network. Some plugins use bridges, v-switches, create overlays. Uh, some plugins like Calico use simple IP routing, okay? Flannel gives you a choice of both. You can actually use both. And just walking through this one example of what Calico does, Calico basically writes this new workload into the shared etcd namespace for, that's uh, available in Kubernetes. Um, the etcd namespace calls out to another Calico agent called Felix running on the node. And what Felix does is inserts routes for that pod's IP addresses into the host routing table, saying if you need to reach that pod, send traffic into this virtual ethernet. So Calico does not use virtual switches, it does not use bridges, it simply sends it to that virtual ethernet, okay? There's another agent running on the node called Bird, which is a BGP agent, and so all the Calico nodes within the cluster are paired together using standard BGP. And so what that means is when Bird detects these new routes, it advertises that route to other nodes in the cluster as an aggregated route. And so within a matter of milliseconds, every node in the cluster knows that these new pods are reachable from from through this node. So any traffic destined to that pod is sent to that node without any encapsulation, without any overlays, right? For those of you coming from a Neutron OVS world, this might be a little bit of a foreign concept, but your networking is really simple. It really is. I see a few people laughing. Networking should be simple. If you're looking at scale, so that's basically what Calico does. I have another example, and Calico runs as a pod, so you, it's fairly non-intrusive in the host stack. And your actual data traffic simply flows with normal in, uh, Linux routing. In this case, Calico is not in a data path. It's simple IP forwarding, right? Uh, no, no, no real magic to it. 
Flannel is another example. This is one of the early plugins available for Kubernetes. And Flannel has a variety of ways that it can provide the actual networking. To give you an example of a different networking plugin, uh, again, called, Flannel is called using CNI. So Kubelet calls CNI. In this case, it says it gives Flannel some configuration parameters like uh, use, uh, use MyNet as a bridge. In this case, Flannel actually creates a bridge connecting the virtual ethernets. And it tells you how, how to assign IP addresses. It says use host local. And the way Flannel works is that it assigns a slash 24 for every node in the cluster. And each node assigns IP addresses from that slash 24 to individual pods. From that point on, Flannel has a variety of backends to actually connect the different nodes to each other, right, and to exchange routes. Uh, the most commonly used backends for Flannel are either host gateway or VXLAN. What happens in host gateway is host gateway assumes there's layer two adjacency between nodes, and in effect, it does simple IP routing by sharing those slash 24 routes among all nodes in the cluster through its CD. And so it does simple unencapsulated packet forwarding, assuming there's layer two adjacency, but in this case, it's not running a dynamic routing protocol. Another common mode of operation for Flannel is VXLAN, and this is a standard overlay that many of you are used to. So if you want to use an overlay for whatever reason, you can absolutely do so with something like Flannel. And when you use VXLAN, obviously you're paying a little bit of a performance penalty for doing VXLAN encapsulation. Depending on your NIC card, depending on how it's implemented, there might be ways to offset some of that performance overhead. But again, this is standard VXLAN overlays. So that's a couple of examples of how uh, Calico and Flannel work. There are other network plugins in the market um, today, there's increasing numbers of network plugins, but generally, the, what tends to happen is the, um, a lot of the plugins that are coming in tend to bring either specific market uh, inputs or they tend to have specific features they tend to claim. I'm, I don't want to be in the business of comparing for you which is the best plugin. I think you should really make that call for yourself based on individual plugins' merits. And if you're, if you're interested, I would certainly encourage you to talk to more folks who, are, who have built Kubernetes deployments at, at scale, and I'm, I'm sure they will guide you in terms of some of the plugin choices. But that's one part of the Kubernetes networking story, which is how do you connect pods to each other? Again, keep in mind, pods are just dynamic instances that can be spun up and down, and these are typically fleeting instances in Kubernetes, right? And typically, the way you would have multiple pods for an application is you would, you would either configure a, rep, a replica set or a replication controller, which is the older concept, which is to say I'm running an Nginx application and I want 10 replicas. And Kubernetes spins up 10 instances of Nginx, each as a pod. The next concept, which is the one I referred to as a very powerful concept in Kubernetes, is this concept of having uh, namespaces labels, selectors, and network policy, which are all instruments to help you declare in YAML syntax typically how you want to isolate different objects from each other. Typically, objects refer to pods. It could refer to other instances, too. And so, first of all, the concept of namespace is the, the capability where you can take a Kubernetes cluster and sort of logically partition it into virtual clusters so that you can isolate different projects from each other. It is not true sort of multi-tenancy. There's other elements of RBAC and other features coming into Kubernetes, which in fact have come into Kubernetes. But namespace is loosely that concept where you can sort of partition your cluster into virtual uh, namespaces. In addition, in Kubernetes, you can assign an arbitrary label to any object. You can have as many labels as you want. So you can label a pod as a LDAP server. You can label this same pod as a LDAP in something in production. You can label this pod as uh, team colon project A. The other thing you can do is now you can now select using a label selector what you want to match on. So you can say all objects and all pods that have the label LDAP server and all pods that belong to project A. And using this concept of labels and selectors, now you can declare in a YAML syntax to say a, a developer or the deployer can say, 
I want to allow all LDAP servers, labeled project A, to talk to all LDAP servers or LDAP clients in project A over port 636. And you can have multiple sort of uh, policies. And what that means is now it's up to the implementation of network policy in Kubernetes to enforce that policy dynamically, okay? So I've given this example here with Calico. The way Calico does that is by taking those policies and on each node independently instantiating whether objects with that pod exist. And if they do, then it creates IP tables, actually IP sets rules dynamically, which is enforced at the virtual ethernet connecting into the pod. So it's enforced at the very end point. And similarly, at the other end, if there's an LDAP client, it'll similarly create IP sets independently on that end. So it's sort of a decentralized architecture. And there are different implementations of network policy. They all behave differently, and you, you should take a look at what your preferred implementation does. But fundamentally, that's what they do. And so this concept of network policy is a really powerful concept, which allows you to now enforce isolation with policy rather than using a network topology to enforce isolation. And this is something that the OpenStack community, specifically the Neutron community, uh, needs to understand as Neutron looks to integrate closer with Kubernetes, because this gives you the opportunity to fund fundamentally simplify networking as you look at combining Neutron with Kubernetes networking, okay? Let's move on to the concept of services which is, um, like I said, a service is the ability to now have an abstraction to, uh, to, uh, to provide a front end for a collection of pods. And so in this case, I've got a couple of pods that uh, which are, I've got this little pink circle here, which are supposed to indicate, let's say, they're running two instances of an Nginx uh, application, right? They're both same, doing the same application, they've got the same labels, they're basically two instances of the service. And in Kubernetes, you can expose that service either with a YAML syntax with kubectl, or you can run something like kubectl expose and give it this command, and that's how you expose the service. And when you do that, this is typically what happens in Kubernetes. First of all, it launches a little daemon called kubeproxy, and this kubeproxy daemon runs on every node in the cluster. And kubeproxy essentially operates by setting up IP tables rules in the node that map the service into the backend pods. And to give you an example of different ways you can implement the service abstraction, uh, one of the common ways is what's called a cluster IP. So if you were to say, I now want a service for Nginx that's served by 10 different pods in the backend, Essentially, this Nginx service will receive a cluster IP, which is a well-known IP within the Kubernetes cluster. And Cube Proxy's IP tables rules take care of translating, doing a DNAT on any traffic going to that cluster IP and translating it to the actual pod's IP address, okay? So it bas basically, it's, uh, it's DNAT that helps you translate from the service's cluster IP to the actual pod IP address. And the SKU proxy and the IP, IP tables rules run on every node in the cluster. This takes care of when you have services within the cluster that need to use services. So if you have a Redis application that needs to talk to an Nginx, Redis can say, here's, here's my Nginx well-known cluster IP. And so that traffic can flow east-west. But sometimes you need traffic from outside the cluster to come into the cluster. And the way to do that is something called node ports. And what node ports is, is that Kubernetes, in addition to having a cluster IP, now assigns a port from a well-known port range, typically by default 30,000 to 37,000, and gives a port, a well-known port to that service. And now traffic coming to any node in the cluster destined to that port essentially gets translated using DNAT rules and sent to the actual port IP address. Another way you can do a services is using a, a service of type uh, load balancer. In this case, what Kubernetes does is that for certain well-known load balancers like uh, Google's load balancer, Amazon's uh, e uh, ELB, uh, a handful of other well-known load balancers, uh, Kubernetes basically creates the load balancer rules to translate services to pod IPs dynamically. So it's a way to do service mappings from services to the backend pods, right? So, so far, so good. So now you've sort of done this mapping of services to pods, 
the next step is how do you actually find what the service's IP addresses are? Sometimes you may want to find the actual pod's IP addresses because as a client, you might think, okay, I can do better load balancing than have Cube Proxy do it for me, so sometimes that might be preferred. And there's a variety of ways you can do that. You can use any of the classic service discovery mechanisms in Kubernetes, that's perfectly fine. One of the default ones that Kubernetes provides, which you're welcome to use, is called KubeDNS. And today there are different DNS servers, there's core DNS, there's a number of implementations that can be plugged in as well. But the way KubeDNS works is that, first of all, it, cre it creates a DNS client resolver mapping within every pod that says when the pod does a DNS lookup, it gets sent to KubeDNS. So KubeDNS essentially becomes a DNS server resolving client queries. And when a new service is created within a namespace, um, KubeDNS essentially creates a DNS name that maps from the name, na name of the uh, service and creates a domain. So if you have a service named web server and in a namespace called project red, it creates a domain called web server that project red that service that cluster that local within the Kubernetes domain. And so when the client does a lookup for say web server, it'll get pointed to the default web server in that same namespace. But if the client wants to pick a different namespace, it, it's absolutely free to do so, okay? Simple DNS, and DNS works in the form of pods, so the actual DNS implementation runs as a pod within the cluster. Fairly simple. Ingress resources, again, it runs as an add-on in Kubernetes, just like DNS. Uh, again, the ingress resource essentially allows you to define a arbitrary set of layer five through seven mappings that define what needs to happen when application mapping, matching that uh, pattern shows up. So in this case, you can now define ingress controllers uh, that can process that incoming data. And these ingress controllers run as pods within your Kubernetes cluster. So if you, I'm showing an Nginx example here, you can use Nginx as an ingress controller. And what happens is when traffic comes in to the Nginx controller, the, you provide a sort of mapping that says if the HTTP host header says the host name is foo.bar.com, send traffic this way to this pod. If the HTTP header is bar.foo.com, send traffic this other way to the other pod. And so you can use this concept of ingress controllers to sort of redirect your traffic based on application semantics. And you can have sort of arbitrary L5 to L7 controllers for depending on what sort of applications you want. Again, a fairly powerful concept, but it's sort of a new concept for many folks in the OpenStack community. And this is again an area where there's a lot of evolution and innovation happening as well. So I wanted to give you a demo, so that's, let's get to that. Uh, if anyone wants to time me in terms of how long this is gonna take, I might first need to combine my screens here. Okay, so what I have here is essentially uh, a master node, which I've gotten here in this terminal. Just to be safe, I will uh, open up a second window on that same master node. I also have a couple of worker nodes, and these are instances running in the cloud. Uh, pick your favorite cloud. You can Node two. By the way, are you guys in the back able to see this? Okay, someone show, give me a show of hands. Okay, good. All right, so let's start by working on the master node. And uh, actually, I just need to make sure I have my cube config there as well when I run cube. Can. So uh, let's start here. So I'm using Kube Admin, which is one of the simpler ways to, to deploy Kubernetes. There's dozens of deployment tools in Kubernetes today. 
Many of them come with B networking by default, something like Flannel, Flannel or Calico, other plugins. But uh, if you don't, Cube Admin is a fairly simple way to get started. There's lots of other tools. Um, so I'm, I'm using Cube Admin here because it's simple. So what you would do, uh, to start with, on the master, you would run something called Cube ADM init. Let's hope the demo gods are kind to us. And essentially what Cube Admin, Cube Admin init is doing is it's launching all of the, the key Kubernetes daemons on the master and uh, configures them. So uh, if, it, if things go well, pretty soon it should come up and say, all right, things are looking good so far, voila. So it says I'm now ready to uh, have clients or worker nodes join the cluster. Before we get to that, let's do one thing. Let's start cube cuddle, which is how you sort of look at what's happening in the, uh, in the cluster. In fact, let's do a watch. I can't seem to type today. I am not able to type today. All right, there we go. All right, and so uh, let me make this smaller. All right, so there's your, it's telling you what's currently running, and basically you've got a bunch of Kubernetes um, uh, processes running. These are all running in the kube system namespace, which is sort of the master, it's a namespace for all of the Kubernetes specific stuff run. Now, before we do anything else, we'll also have to do this. We'll have to connect some sort of networking, because without networking, Kubernetes doesn't, it's not really worth very much, is it? Uh, and I'm installing Calico. Calico is, is encapsulated as a, uh, as a self-hosted networking solution. So you actually launch Calico by running it as a pod, a daemon set on top, of Cali on top of Kubernetes. So that means this Calico daemon, this Calico pod, gets launched on every node in the cluster, okay? And so when I do this, you'll see the Calico node pods get launched. Uh, and if you look at the watch, you see the Calico etcd, you see the Calico node launch. And pretty soon, I think pretty much most of the pods that are pending will go into running state. Uh, DNS will not yet because there are no schedulable nodes. So now that that is done, you have networking going. What we'll do is we'll run this command on the worker nodes. And let's start by doing it on worker one. And when I do that, you'll see additional Calico node processes la launch in here. And in fact, you can also do it from here. So we can launch both workers at the same time. And hopefully, if things go well, you see, okay, your second one is shown up, and pretty soon you'll see a third one as well. It tells you that these are running in the host namespace, and so guess what? Suddenly you have Calico nodes being created, and now everything in the cluster is running. Did, was anyone timing me? Was that two minutes, five minutes? You have your Kubernetes cluster up, with networking. So next step, let's launch some applications on it. And to give you an idea how you do this, again, uh, let's go back to the master, and let's do everyone's favorite application, Nginx. Uh, actually, let's, before we do that, let's create a namespace. call it policy. All right, and let's run, I cannot type today for some reason. Uh, how many replicas do we want? Let's say 10, right? 
All right, and so now you see this Nginx pod is being spun up in the, ne in the network. You should see all of them receive an IP address through Calico, and voila, we are up and running. So now if you want to look at what the actual network infrastructure looks like, let's go to the worker node, and let's do an IP address show. And you see all of these interfaces, Kali, whatever, those essentially are interfaces, virtual ethernets connecting to the individual pods. Each of them have an IP address, and each of them connect to, um, connect to the Nginx pods. If you do an IP route show, there are your routes. So for all the pods running on that particular node, here are the slash 32 routes pointing to the virtual ethernets. For the route, for the Nginx pods running on a different node, here's the routes that have been advertised by BGP with an aggregated slash 26 route. So for any reason your connectivity fails, guess what, you just look up your routing table, is there a route? If not, go troubleshoot standard BGP. If the route exists but you don't have uh, connectivity, you would do things like look at the IP tables to see if there's any policy that's preventing traffic from being, from being stopped. But networking in Kubernetes, that's all it is. You have really powerful networking. This networking scales to, the current scale targets for Kubernetes are up to 5,000 nodes. Right, it used to be 1,000 nodes, 100,000 containers. Now it's 5,000 nodes. I believe five, 5 million containers. I forget what the number of containers was. But it works. It's simple. Right? And that's, that's sort of an illustration of why Kubernetes networking is, the way it was designed, is designed to keep things simple and yet scalable. And I want to sort of leave you with a little bit more on what's coming tomorrow, which is a bit more of the advanced concepts. Right? And so tomorrow at the session where I'm joined by Canonical and AT&T, we'll talk to you through a little bit more of the use cases around when you, how you want to combine Kubernetes and OpenStack together. And there's sort of three scenarios for that. Scenario one is where you're running Kubernetes on bare metal and you have clusters of Kubernetes, and you have OpenStack also running on bare metal, but you have applications that need to talk to each other. You might have an LDAP server on one and LDAP clients on the other, right? And, um, there's different ways to do that. There's different approaches. The Calico approach is to do simple, net, simple networking, BGP pairing, essentially, and using labels and policy to define what can talk to what. The second sort of scenario is when you're running OpenStack on bare metal and you have individual virtual machines running Kubernetes nodes. So Kubernetes is, in effect, running inside of OpenStack. Uh, and again, there's in, in, in the case of Calico, which I'll talk about tomorrow, it's simple BGP peering, simple networking, and you use policy. And the third scenario is, is actually a really interesting scenario which we're seeing more and more in the industry now, which is Kubernetes is running on bare metal, takes care of things like the auto-scaling, the provisioning, the upgrades, the lifecycle management, and OpenStack is running as a containerized application on top of Kubernetes. In this case, what the benefit is that the OpenStack control plane is containerized, and so as you need more capacity, you can auto-scale. Also, uh, Kubernetes can take care of things like upgrades, rolling upgrades, as you need to move from OpenStack version to version. And uh, this is sort of the use, this is the demonstration that AT&T has been showing, which is using it, uh, OpenStack Helm as the OpenStack project to do this. And they actually use Calico for the networking fabric. But what they do, what they're actually showing is being able to do a deployment of OpenStack as a containerized application on top of Kubernetes, and then upgrade it and being able to do that within a matter of a few minutes, which is a really powerful concept. And so the inner BGP, Calico, uh, Calico BGP peers with outer Calico BGP and that's simple IP routing, right? And you use policy to isolate between applications. So that's something we'll talk about tomorrow. So sort of to wrap up the session here and to take any questions, the things I want to sort of emphasize is that when you start looking at Neutron and Kubernetes, these are different abstractions, but they do have sort of different targets, in, that they did have different targets in mind when they were designed. Neutron was sort of designed for virtual machine scale, and so it can handle 5, 10 VMs a second, depending on how complex your Neutron environment is. Kubernetes is designed for container scale. You're talking about launching hundreds, potentially thousands of pods a second, right? And so it's a different sort of scale target. So when you start connecting Neutron and uh, Kubernetes, 
you have to give a little bit of thought to what you're connecting. Are you sort of overloading the complexity of one into the other when you're connecting them? And you really want to give some design thought into that when you, before you do anything, right? So that's one sort of key highlight I want to point out. The second thing is that Kubernetes networking abstractions are different from Neutron's networking abstractions, and that's intentionally so because Kubernetes is focused in this world of microservices that we live in, which is a much more rapidly changing world than the world that OpenStack and Neutron were originally designed for, which, which was virtual machine networking, right? So the abstractions have, have, are quite different. Certainly, Neutron has slowly evolved, but I, I think as it's evolved, it's also picked up some complexity, and uh, there needs to be some focus, especially for people deploying, or people deploying and operating uh, networking at scale to focus on the operations part of it, because there's, a, there's key elements from an operational scale perspective. And finally, this is a key concept in Kubernetes networking, which is it gives you the option of keeping networking simple and using policy for isolation. Does not mean you have to follow that principle. It gives you the option. Now, absolutely, you can, you can implement your networking in any fashion that works for you, uh, but it also gives you the ability to keep your networking configuration simple and actually use a declarative model like network policy to provide the isolation, which is a really powerful concept. And this is a concept that's sort of been embraced by all of the other major container orchestrators. They're all moving in this direction, if they haven't already. And so this is really an opportunity. It's an inflection point for us to all think about uh, how we have deployed networking in the past, in the early days of cloud networking, and to sort of rethink what we can do moving forward, how we can fundamentally simplify and focus on scaling networking to much bigger infrastructures. So that said, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take some questions now. I'm not sure how much time I have. Looks like I have about five minutes here. Yeah. Uh, just that one clarification question. Do all the containers in the pod share the same network namespace? No. Uh, well, so all the so a pod is a collection of containers, and essentially the pods or the containers within a pod share a network namespace. Only the network namespace, but process file namespaces are separated. Uh, again, it, uh, generally that's a namespace that's created by Kubelet. I couldn't speak to all of the different namespaces, okay. but at least as far as network namespace, which I'm pretty familiar with, that's what happens. And the way, it, if you actually look in, into how it's created, there's something called the pause container that gets launched. And the only job of a pause container is to keep that namespace alive. So it's a very simple way to get a namespace going. Pause, like if, you, if, you do a, if you look at what's running on a node, there's something called a PAUSE, pause, and all that's doing is creating a network namespace. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, at the time you're doing the kubectl apply calico.yaml, yep. is there some baseline network already running, or is it just the management plane that is used for all operations? Just running? the management plane. Obviously, all the nodes are also connected, but uh, at this point, the master doesn't know about any of the nodes. All you're doing when you do a kubectl apply calico.yaml is you're creating a daemon set that says anytime a new node comes up, launch the calico node or calico pod on that node. So it essentially preps your Kubernetes cluster for networking. And so the first time a, a, a worker node joins the cluster, the Calico node sign up, launches on that, on that uh, clustered node, and you have networking automatically. Okay. Uh, I saw that you mentioned something about uh, solutions with Kubernetes, like Cal sure. Calico, Flannel, et cetera. Right? Sure. There's numerous, I mean, there's yeah. Contrail, there's Contive, there's, there's a, dozens of plugins out there. Yeah. So I have a similar question regarding the network policies. Say, for example, in an enterprise data center, um, people are moving from IP tables to more advanced or modern policy engines like Illumio. So yep. does Kubernetes have plugins for policy engines as well as of right now? Or no? Yeah, but good question. So today, policy is enforced at typically the ingress point or the egress point, depending on which way you look at it, into the pods. And uh, it's really a function of the network plugin to implement policy. So Calico has sort of a policy engine that was uh, the team behind Calico helped develop network policy for Kubernetes. So it's sort of a uh, Kubernetes policy is a subset of Calico. That said, there are different policy implementations. Some of them are closed source. Some of them are sort of learning approaches. Um, so, for example, you look at things like Illumio, they tend to be learning approaches. Some of them are closed source, some of them are open source. 
It's really a functional network plugin. The thing I will point out is in the world of microservices, especially as you move towards things like functions as a service and serverless, the model where you try and learn something in the network doesn't necessarily scale because things are too transient. And so the, most of the container orchestrators tend to have this model of declarative, uh, um, uh, declarative syntax where you actually declare what you want the application to do and then ha enforce that policy. So things like Calico sort of follow that model. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Hello, um, my question is about the, uh, the ingress uh, filtering. Mm -hmm. You showed an example where we're filtering on host, which is a, uh, on source host, which is a really ho common case. Um, it, how, how flexible is, uh, is this part of the stack? Can, can it uh, filter on some other aspect of the packet? Uh, so, uh, so if, let me dif distinguish between policy and ingress. So ingress, when I use the Nginx example there, uh, Nginx is the ingress controller, and you have sort of the ingress resource defined that calls out, hey, for this mapping, you need to do this. That function, so that's sort of the I concept of ingress. Now, network policy is a sort of a distinct concept from ingress, and in network policy today, Kubernetes supports just ingress filtering. So what that means is that you can tell the pod how to protect it, so, or the pod can tell you how to protect it from the rest of the world. You cannot express in Kubernetes today how to protect the rest of the world from the pod. So there is no egress filtering yet in Kubernetes. Uh, if you look at specific network policy implementations like Calico, for example, Calico does have egress filtering. It also has more operational focused policy. But Kubernetes itself is sort of a developer focused platform and so uh, the community decided that since most developers care about ingress and protecting themselves from the world, let's do ingress filtering first. And so egress filtering, filtering has been deferred for later. It's possible it might come. There's been discussions within the Kubernetes SIG network community about potentially looking at egress filtering as well. Okay, good question, by the way. Great, thank you so much for your questions. I know the next discussion is gonna be interesting as well, which is gonna be talking about kind of combining Kubernetes and OpenStack and uh, four and a half dozen ways you can do that. Some simple, hopefully let's talk about the simple ones, but also many of them tend to be very complex. And I'd also give a plug for joining the session tomorrow with, uh, that I'll be doing jointly with Canonical and AT&T, which is sort of talking about the same concept, but purely from a networking perspective. Okay, thank you so much. Cheers.